I'm Monster Face, and I'm a horror addict. And it's Valentine's Day. Yeah, I'm the only one tonight, because everybody else has a hot Valentine's date, except for me. But Lol's helped me not only set up my castle with radio equipment, but he's gonna use his magic so everyone has to listen to what I play. And I think I'll play the most romantic song that I can possibly think of. And that is Walk Like a Zombie by the Horror Pops. He said everyone would literally have to listen to the song. He really exaggerated the word literally. And then he did the whole Mr. Burns thing. Yeah, yeah, like that, yeah. That's what he did, it, it was weird. Anyways, what could go wrong? And if you're watching this on, you know, Valentine's Day, that means you probably don't have a date either. So why don't I cheer you up by reviewing one of my favorite Valentine's Day movies of all time, Pony Pool. You walk like some man. You talk like some this 2008 film was directed by Bruce McDonald. He directed Hellions, which is a favorite of mine. <laughs> Those little kids remind me of Laws. He also directed uh, My Babysitter's a Vampire. Um, okay. And uh, there was like the Dreamland spinoff that he just came out with. But, uh, you know, he also did uh, Knock Knock. You're thinking, wait, Heli Roth directed Knock Knock. No, I'm talking about the 1985 version, Knock Knock. Heavily underappreciated, if you ask me. This movie was uh, based off of the book by Tony Burgess, uh, Pawnee Pool Changes Everything, which came out in 1995. But then Tony Burgess also did the screenplay adaptation, which is now this movie. I've never actually read Pawnee Pool Changes Everything, so I don't know how exactly accurate it is, but I did read Lullaby by Chuck Palinitnik. I don't know. The, you know, the, I can't pronounce that name. He also, but, you know, he did Fight Club, damn it. And, you know, uh, Haunted. Though it has similarities about words being used as weapons and such, uh, it's more about witches. Well, this one's kind of about zombies. I'm sorry, the creators of this film say they're not zombies. They're conversationalists. Whatever the fuck that means. And this movie stars one of the most badass actors of all time, Stephen McHattie. He plays the controversial radio host, Grant Mazzy. He's a dude that gives no fucks and no apologies. He's just a badass. And hell, look, he's dressed like Joe Bob Briggs. You gotta respect that. A lot of you might recognize McHattie as Hollis Mason, aka Night Owl from Watchmen. He's a real dark individual who starred in a lot of dark movies. Hell, he was in The Dark, The Dark Room, The Dark Stranger, Wolves, Torment. He was the Pale Man in Haunter. He was also in Ka and Die, The Tall Man. Septic Man, Hellmouth, Z, the remake of Rabbit recently, and also very recently he was in Come to Daddy, not to mention Eddie and the Sleepwalking Cannibal. But my favorite role that he's ever had is the narrator from Basketball. The Minneapolis Lakers moved to Los Angeles, where there are no lakes. The Oilers moved to Tennessee, where there is no oil. The Jazz moved to Salt Lake City, where they don't allow music. And what's up with the little town of Pawnee Pool? It's in Ontario, Canada. And you see, when Tony Burgess wrote his first book, he was gonna need a picture for the About the Author page. So, while driving out to the lake to take a picture, he noticed the sun was already going down. So he just pulled over to the nearest town called Pawnee Pool. And with the pressure of needing to write a second book, he thought, what the hell, I owe Pawnee Pool, I'll write about them. And it didn't hurt that typo was in the title. So while Mazzy is driving to Pawnee Pool on one snowy Valentine's Day night, He's on the phone with his agent, who he fires, because screw it, why the hell should he have to work in Pawnee Pool? But, you know, as we learn later on, he's a controversial radio host who was, uh, well, fired for probably <laughs> speaking his mind too often. The dude would not last on Twitter nowadays, that's for sure. This is news to me. But before he even gets to work, Mazzy is approached by a crazy woman just in the snow, and she's rambling some nonsense, but it's pretty hard to understand what she's saying. But he decides to think not too much of it, as he just makes light of it later while at work. His producer, director, whatever, the lady in charge at the radio station, is played by his wife in real life, Lisa Hall. Her name is Sydney Blair, she was in the horror movie Ejecta, and she also co-stars with McHattie in the spin-off Dreamland. They really butt heads as Mazzy really pushes his way, making fun of a lot of the local little town, and just saying what's on his mind. Talk about lost cats, and about local cops getting drunk while people are upset about ice fishing season being over. 
though he does seem to get along charmingly with Laurel Ann. She's a bit of a local hero herself. Laurel Ann did a tour of duty in Afghanistan not too, too long ago. And she's played by Georgina Riley, who was also in The Dark Room. And the TV series, My Babysitter's a Vampire. There's a TV movie of it, and apparently a TV series that followed later. Okay, as tensions start to rise at the radio station between the crew members, they check in with Ken Lonely in the Sunshine Chopper. Boy, I wouldn't want to be a bird if this storm hits the way it's supposed to. And leave Ken alone. <laughs> leave her alone! Yeah, but it turns out... Ken Loney's not in a chopper. The Sunshine Chopper is Ken's Dodge Dart. Ken's only a voice in this film, but he's a very crucial character nonetheless. He's played by Rick Roberts. This movie does a pretty good job at just kind of building up its characters. From the stories that are coming in, you know there's something vaguely going on that's kind of creepy, but all hell doesn't quite break loose until Ken gives an eyewitness report from his Sunshine Chopper about what's going down at a local doctor office. And with all that craziness, they decide to follow things up with a little more relaxing listening with uh, local high school act Lawrence of Arabia? What, what the fuck is this? And that's Tony Burgess, by the way, <laughs> playing Lawrence himself. Okay, so that was radio friendly, apparently. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> One more time. Yeah. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure that actually happened. However, this is where we kind of see for ourselves things are starting to go wrong. As one of our young performers here uh, starts to have some sort of weird stroke. She's what the kids would say nowadays as sus. Uh, even the BBC checks in because they're curious to why the town seems to be quarantined and surrounded by the military. All roads to the little town seem to be blocked off. And that, I can tell you, is a huge red flag. If this ever happens to you, uh, and you're in a little town, you are screwed. See, first thing you should ever do in a zombie apocalypse is find out if it's happening everywhere or just in your town. If it's just your town, get the fuck out of there, because they're going to fucking wipe it off the planet. If it's everywhere, then you're probably okay, because they probably have bigger fish to fry. See, this is like one of the coolest zombie movies you could listen to. Yeah, it doesn't show a whole lot, but it does still manage to be pretty chilling. I wouldn't say it trumps the audiobook of World War Z, but it is pretty damn good. The exploits of Ken Lonely itself is very interesting. I recommend that you hear it. I mean, see it? Whatever. Check it out. I don't plan on telling you exactly how it ends, but I will throw up the spoiler thing just in case I give you maybe a little bit more than the synopsis tells you. We get some more grueling details uh, about what's going on with Ken. Yeah, it's cool that, like, that is apparently coming out of the mouth of somebody. Like, just... A child is screaming inside his breath. Weird noises people are able to repeat. Though, it's not completely consistent, because there's this part where Laurel Ann starts to freak out, and she's mimicking a whistling teapot. However, she's not sounding just like the teapot, and according to what we're hearing over the radio, the conversationalists, uh, whatever, zombies, they're actually able to mimic the sound precise, so how come Laurel Ann can't do it? Excuse me. I'm not sure. Please, don't be alarmed. I'm Dr. John Mendez. See, this virus is being spread through the English language, and certain words activate it for certain people. And this isn't quite explained in the movie, but apparently, you know, you start to, like, you get stuck thinking about a word and what it means, and then you, like, get scrambled, and you start repeating yourself, and then you find yourself in a situation to where you only can feel better if you chew your way through the mouth of someone else. That's, uh, that, that's pretty, that's pretty fucking gruesome. <laughs> Chew your way through the mouth of another person? I'm not sure exactly how that would even work, but damn, who would have fucking thought? What? Anytime they're talking or basically hearing the English language, they are at risk of becoming infected. And, uh, that, that's, that's pretty hard to 
stay safe from. Thankfully, they're in Canada, where, you know, a lot of people speak French, so uh, they have that going for them. <laughs> There's not a whole lot of gore in this movie, but what little they do show you is pretty good. Laurel Ann, like, just fucking obliterates her head into the soundproof glass, trying to get to them. Damn, that's pretty fucking hardcore. <laughs> The local little uh, high school production of Lawrence of Arabia comes back, so they deal with some zombies in this movie. There's just not a whole lot. Conversationalist, excuse me. Sorry if I mix up my words here. You are listening and hanging on to them, I am sure. Eventually, the whole radio station is pretty much surrounded, and you feel like that military is closing in. Then the doctor kind of gets stuck, so it's up to Mazzy and Sydney to try and figure out one way or another how to get out of this situation. They try everything from just not talking and figuring out how to not understand something that you understand. Basically, they want to unlearn English. Kill is kiss? Kill is kiss. What is kill? Kill is kiss. Huh. Maybe I should have played Love Gun. That, that song's pretty romantic. Apparently that's also from a movie called Kill the Clown, which that sounds pretty damn awesome. There's one last desperate attempt to try and just debunk all this and save the town. Hello, Pontypool. This is Grant Mazzy here, and today... Anyways, I just feel like this movie has not been talked about enough. I mean, the poster of it was uh, featured in Twilight. I know Dreamland is supposed to be a spinoff, and there is some crazy nonsense after all the credits. There's some cool, like, things to hear during the credits, but the thing after the credits, uh, it really has nothing to do with this movie. It's just weird, and I uh, assume it's used as a setup for Dreamland. But an actual direct sequel is uh, rumored to be in the works, so uh, stay tuned, listeners. What the hell's going on outside? What the hell is that nonsense? Nobody else is supposed to be here. Everybody's on a date. What the hell's that noise? Ah, oh, shit, you think this is what the lols meant by literally have to listen to the song? Ah, oh, crap, uh, Well, you know, in the words of Christian Slater, uh, pump up the volume! <laughs> They'll never silence me! Get, get the hell out of here! You know, like and subscribe and all that shit, uh, uh send help! Wait, you're, you're probably all, like, zombies at home, too. Fuck! Ah, uh, oh, man. Ah, uh, lols, help! Leave help in the comments! Oh, <laughs> <laughs>